I'd like to welcome you to the very first of our Friday night uh, messages by Ken Rudolph here at Lake Ann Camp. We are <laughs> I'd just like to say a few things to those of you that are, that are here uh, and watching online. Uh, we first of all want to say thank you uh, for so many of you that have been generous uh, to the camp. Uh, God's been so good to us. We've been able to do a lot of projects. Uh, some gifts have come in for maintenance and and we're preparing and getting the camp ready for the next time that you can come. Uh, we're praying that that'll be freeze outs in January. Uh, <laughs> coming up. One of the traditions of Friday nights is to take an offering and that offering doesn't go to Lake Ann. All of that money goes to uh, missions around the world. We've been able to be involved in, in uh, 13 different countries over the years, starting camps or supporting camps. And since we're not having any campers here, if you want to give uh, to that offering, even though you're not here participating with us, we invite you to go to lakehandcamp.com to the donate section, and then just click down to the missions. And if you give, what little you give, or as much as you can give, we will not use it for Lake Ann, but we'll use it to help camping around the world. And we're so grateful for the opportunity to be a part of so many different um, places. The last, uh, last trip we made was to South Africa, uh, to a camp there. And God's really using what we've been able to do there. So we want to thank you for that. So tonight, Ken Rudolph is going to be speaking. We also have a group of alumni from Cedarville that are all hearts on uh, alumni from Lake Ann. And they've gotten together and they put together a, a little package so that you can sing with us. There'll be three songs uh, from them. And when they're done, Ken Rudolph is going to come and he's going to speak. So welcome to the very first uh, recorded live service here on June 26th. God bless you.
Every giant will fall, the mountains will move Every chain of the past, you've broken in two All the fear of the lies, we're singing the truth That nothing is impossible Every giant will fall, the mountains will move Every chain of the past, you've broken in two
crowned with glory now the Savior knelt to wash our feet now at his feet we bow the one who wore our sin
Welcome to Friday night on a beautiful day when it's storming outside. I don't know if those of you in TV land can hear what's going on here, but uh, we're going to have a rainstorm outside. But there is sunshine in our hearts, amen? Because we have Jesus as our Savior. And uh, that's always been my desire is to share Jesus with people. I met Jesus at a camp just like this 54 years ago and uh, I have I rejoice in my salvation and what the Lord has done and I love my Lord Jesus and I hope you do too there's a lot of great messages in the Bible that we can get that uh, inspire us to be witnesses for Jesus like I said when I met Christ my Savior at uh, camp I went home I'm like the whole world needs to hear this. The whole world needs to hear this story that Jesus saves. If you were listening a couple of weeks ago, I gave my story about how I came to know Jesus. I thought that you had to work your way to heaven. And uh, so I was going to church, you know, trying to earn my way to heaven and trying not to do certain things and yet the sin was getting worse in my life. The preacher got up and at camp and he said, you know what? You cannot work your way to heaven. It is a gift of God. And I'd never heard that before. And I realized if I was going to get to heaven, the only way I was going to get is if God did give it to me as a gift. And that's why Jesus died on the cross. And I thought, wow, I, I, I knew Jesus had died on the cross, but I didn't know that he did it for me. And so that night I accepted Christ as my Savior as my substitute. He took my place and took my sin, and therefore I can live forever with him in heaven. Is that good news? Amen. Well, we have a story in the Old Testament about a young man who also wanted to witness for God. His name is David. Let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17, if you have your Bibles. 1 Samuel chapter 17. David is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. He's not perfect by any means. In fact, the Bible records some of the devastating sins of his life. But the truth of the matter is, is that he knew God as his salvation. He had come to a point where he had been justified by faith too. We were not told when that happened, but we are told that he wanted to stand up for the witness of God, the God of the Bible. And so as we look at the story of 1 Samuel 17, and most of you are probably familiar with it, it's a famous story of David and Goliath. David and Goliath. And uh, we all know that Goliath was a giant. And David was just a shepherd boy. He was probably somewhere in his teenage years. Uh, they believe he was somewhere between the age of 14 and 19. So, you know, he wasn't a, a, a tested man of war in a sense. But he was the only one that was willing to go out and fight the giant. Now let me set the scene for you here, chapter 17. Israel, God's nation, uh, the, the, the covenant, the receiver of the covenants was Israel. They believed in the God of the Bible, the God of creation. His name was Jehovah. And uh, they always had an arch enemy, the Philistines. The Philistines had their own set of gods. Israel had one God, the true God. And I don't know about you, but I believe I serve the true God, the true living God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And I want to be a witness for Him. I love my, my Lord, and you know what? David loved his Lord too. Now what's going on is you have Israel and the Philistines there. It says their armies were drawn up in array. What does that mean? Well, it means you get your flags out, you shine the shields, you know, and you, you kind of line up. Uh, they said that one was on one hill and the other army was on another hill, and there was a valley down between them. And so when you 
drew, drew your armies up in array, you, you were trying to psych out the other team, the other army, so to speak. You, we, we do that in sports sometimes, you know. I like in high school football games when, you know, the players come out of the locker room and they run through paper. You know, they're like, yeah, our team, and they come, they bust through a thing of paper. The other team's supposed to be like, oh no, they can run through paper. <laughs> you know, we're doomed. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's a spectacle of waving the flags and beating on the shields, you know, and our God's better than your God. And so the Philistines, you know, they, they were doing this for 40 days. And one of the things that the Philistines used to psych out the Israelites was they would send the champion of their army. Now you got to understand the Philistines, they were warriors by nature. The Israelites were farmers by nature, okay? And so you think of the champion of this warring nation, he's about 10 feet tall. He comes walking down to the valley and he says, instead of our, having our armies fight, he said, Israel, send your best man, send your best warrior. I'm the Philistines' best warrior. Let's fight each other. And if I win, you serve us. If you win, we'll serve you. Of course, most of these guys were probably five foot something in Israel. And they're looking at this 10 foot giant. They're like, there's no way. It records and it tells us that the armor, just the armor of the Philistine. Goliath weighed 125 pounds, just his armor alone. He had a, he, his shield was so big, he had to have another man carry it for him. And so he comes down every day, twice a day, for 40 days as they're deciding when they're going to fight. And can you imagine, it said, I think it's verse 17, it says, or 28, all the... All the, the men of Israel were afraid when they saw this giant. They ran away from him. So anyways, David had eight or seven brothers. He was the youngest of all eight of them. And the youngest shepherd, uh, the youngest boy always became the shepherd of the flock. You know what I mean? The youngest kid always gets the dirty jobs, right? He knew the youngest kid did. And yeah, the youngest kid, they always get the, the rotten jobs. And so David had to be the shepherd. Take care of sheep. Now his three oldest brothers were in this army for Israel. And so they probably had the helmets and the shields and, the, and uh, all the armor on. And, you know, they're standing in line. And for 40 days, they've been watching this giant come and defy the armies of the living God. And they all run away. And then one day, David's father says, hey, by the way, uh, your brothers have been out there for 40 days. They're probably running out of food. Take some bread and cheese to them. And so he said, you know, make sure somebody takes care of the sheep while you're gone. And so he does, and he gives them this bread and this cheese and take it to your brothers. And so David runs out there and he's like, oh man, I get to see the army. You know, I'm sure teenagers love army stuff. You know? So he gets there and hands the bread and the cheese over to the keeper of the baggage. And then he runs out and he finds his brothers. He goes, hey, what's going on, guys? And his brothers are standing there in their stately armor and their helmets and their spears. And they're like, well, look out there. So as David was talking to them, this giant comes out again, the Philistine, Goliath. And he goes, who oh, will fight me? Send your best warrior to fight me. If he wins, we'll serve you. If I win, you serve us. <laughs> and all the men are like, shut up. You know. Your mother wears combat boots. Like, you know, all these, you know, they, nobody wanted to fight him. And David looks down here and he goes, what did he say? And I'm sure Goliath will say, your God's no good. The gods of the Philistines are the true gods. And he goes, no. Dave's like, that's not true. The God of Israel is the true God. And he goes, I'll go fight him. That was his brothers there. They got the armor on that they weren't willing to fight him. They look at their little brother. And I could just see, he said his oldest brother kind of smacks him in the head. He goes, what are you talking about? You're just a young man. You just came to watch the army. You're just a naughty boy. 
Well, he says, well, no. He said, didn't you hear what that guy said about our God? I want to go fight him. I want to, I want to stand up for God. Uh, you're just a naughty boy. I mean, that makes the older brother look pretty bad. Your, your youngest brother's like, I'll go fight him. Now, the question is, David was a teenager. Was he just too stupid to know any better? You know, sometimes teenagers say silly things. You know, they like, oh, I'll, I'll do that. Like, no, it's dangerous. You don't know the danger. Well, they go and they tell King Saul. Saul's been waiting for one of his soldiers to, for 40 days. They would stand up and say, I'll, I'll take on the challenge. So let's pick it up here in verse 37. It says, when the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. Okay? What's King Saul saying? The same thing. He says, listen, you're just a teenager. I said, you know, you're just a young... He said, this guy has been practicing to be a warrior since he was a baby. That's the language in the Hebrew. He said, you, you're just a teenager... But this guy has been training since an infant. And I'll tell you, back in those days, they used to take little kids and start training them right away. As little, little children, they were trained to be warriors. And David's like, let no man's heart fail because I will go and fight him. Now everybody look at me. Are you willing to stand up for Jesus Christ as a witness like David was? There are giants in our world, giants against Jesus today. And sometimes we, you know, we think, well, I'm just a teenager. David was just a teenager. How did he get to the point that he was willing and able to stand up and witness for his God? Where did he get the courage? I want to propose to you that David wasn't just a silly teenager. I believe he was prepared as a witness by the hand of God to stand up for his God. So if you're taking notes, I want to talk about three ways to prepare to be a witness for Jesus Christ. Okay? Three ways to prepare to be a witness for Jesus Christ. You know, we today we need teenagers that are willing to stand up and say, I don't care what you say. Listen, there's going to be a lot of naysayers in your schools. They're going to take you on. They're going to say, ah, there, you know, there's a lot of even atheists. Like, there isn't even a God. Or they say, Jesus Christ, is, he was just a moral man. He wasn't God. And we need teenagers today to stand up and say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he's the Savior of the world. Amen? Well, how did God prepare David? I pray that as we read this, you will take out this challenge and say, God, prepare me in the same way. So, let's look at verse 33. Again, Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he's been a man of war from his youth. Verse 34, but David said to, your, to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear, I took a lamb from, uh, and took a lamb from the flock. I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Okay? Now here's the first thing that I see. Number one, you need to learn to do what's right in God's eyes when you're alone. You need to do what's right in God's eyes when you are alone. Okay? Can I tell you what? Every one of you is going to be given some kind of a job that you think is lowly and you're unworthy of it. And, uh, or, you know, you're, you're like, this is so stupid. And, and 
uh, I, I don't want to do it, and what a waste of my time, and how can this, you know, maybe you want to grow up to be a nuclear physicist, you know, and, and uh, you have to get a job at McDonald's or something. And you start a job like that, and like, man, I can't wait to get out of here. I don't want to go to college. I don't want to get a job someday as a nuclear physicist, uh, or whatever. David could have said that, but I could just see the day when David's father said, well, David, you're the youngest in the family. You get to be the shepherd. What's, what's his attitude? What's your attitude? I don't want to be a shepherd. I don't want to go to a stupid sheep. You know, like, David, get out there right now. So he takes his staff and he's out there. Uh, shut up. You know, I, I think I think maybe David had some challenges with his attitude. But you know what? God put him in that. He says, I, I, you know, I'm going to make you be in charge of sheep. You know, back in chapter 13, it's very interesting. And when God had decided he was going to reject Saul as king of Israel, King Saul had done something foolish and God said, I'm going to take the kingdom from you. He says, I'm going to give it to a, a man after my own heart. You know what God was doing in David's life at that time? He's like, I want, David, I'm going to make you a man after my own heart. I'm going to see who cares about sheep. Who will take care of sheep? And David, you know what? I think he just worked on his attitude. I think he was like, you know, God, you got you to gotta help me. I think this is a silly job, but... This is what my father asked me to do. And the Bible says, you know, children, obey your parents. And so, you know, I, okay, I'm, all right, God, I'm going to do my best. Help me work on my attitude. And, you know, he's standing there, and, okay, I'll, I'll just, yeah, God. And uh, he's there. And nobody's watching him to see if he's going to be a faithful shepherd, see if he's going to do what's right. It's just God watching. And there he is. And, one day, it says, one day a lion came and took a lamb out of the flock. Now, what would you do? Maybe you think, oh, all I got to do is keep these sheep in a, in a flock here, you know, keep them in, a, you know, and, you know, let them eat grass. And that's not too hard. But what happens when one day he's there and, and this lion grabs a lamb, he's like, God, to see, dear God, make him drop the lamb. Dear God, I mean it. Dear God, he didn't drop the man. Oh, what am I going to do? Well, have a nice meal. You know, see you tomorrow. By the time, you know, the summer's over and Jesse, his father, comes to check on the sheep and goes, hey, there's only, there was a hundred sheep or there's only 50. Yeah, well, this lion comes every day and grabs them. Well, did you fight him? Oh, well, he could have killed me. All right, you're not going to be a shepherd anymore. You're not faithful. No, David, he said, a lion came and grabbed the lamb, he said, and I went out after him. And he said, and I pulled it out of his mouth. Can you imagine that? The lion's got this lamb, he's trotting away, like, and this lamb's swinging back and forth. And all of a sudden, David comes up and grabs it. You can't have that. The lion goes, Ooh. He said, he rose up against me. This lion, you ever see those lions on their back? Their back feet, you know, they were rear, roar up, rear up like this, and and uh, said, I grabbed him by his beard, you know, the mane around. He's like, grab him, and I'm just like, you know, he probably had a staff. You know, he, he was a teenage Jewish ninja shepherd, you know. So he's fighting this lion, and he takes this lion on, and he beats the snot out of him, and he kills him, you know. Probably got some scratches on him, some white marks, you know. And he comes back with this little lamb to the flock, and all the flock are like, wow, what a guy. Yay, David. Yay, David. Yay, our hero. You think he had a crowd watching him? That, those sheep didn't say it, and they were like, uh, they're just chewing their cud, and he's like, you guys know what I did for you? We don't care. The lion's dead. You know what? A lot of us were like, I'm not going to do anything 
unless I get praise and credit and, and fame for it. Let me tell you something. You need to learn, number one, learn to do what's right in God's eyes when you're alone. We have many examples in the Bible. If you go way back to the book of Genesis, you have Joseph. You know the story of Joseph? Joseph had 11 brothers, and uh, brothers didn't like him. He was one of the younger ones. They sold him into slavery. Joseph spent 13 years as a slave and then as a prisoner in prison. But he, he did what was right when he was alone. He learned to work hard. And one day, after those 13 years, he became second in command to the Pharaoh of Egypt. Then in the book of Exodus, you have Moses. Moses was famous in, he was famous in, uh, in uh, Egypt. But you have uh, Moses, he spent 40 years in the desert, God teaching him some things. You have the Apostle Paul, he said, after he got saved, he said, I spent three years in the Arabian desert learning some things. Listen, everybody look at me. God is always going to put you in some kind of a isolation or a desert experience. I remember before I became a pastor and uh, I was working as a deacon in a church and they made me become the deacon of buildings and grounds. And I had to mow the lawns and I had to fix the broken windows and I had to start the boiler Sunday morning because it was supposed to start by itself but it never would. And so I'd have to go down at five o'clock in the morning, Sunday morning, make sure it was running. And I used to think, nobody knows I'm down here. And then the Lord spoke to my heart and says, I know you're down here. If you want to be a pastor, you'd be a good deacon first. And I'm like, yeah. I even, listen, there's many toilets I have plugged and nobody knew that I had kept those toilets clean. I had, man, I'll tell you, there's a lot of dirty jobs. Sometimes you do in isolation all alone. And nobody's watching you except who? Everybody. God is watching. And God was watching David. My goodness, did you see that? I can hear God talking to the angels. Did you see that? That, that little boy down there, he just killed a lion. He put his life on the line for a lamb because that's what his responsibility was. So listen, you, you might have a lowly job like working at McDonald's. And you're like, man, you know, and you're flipping hamburgers. And you're like, oh, what a dead-end job. And... You know, all of a sudden, like, oh, oh, I chew. You sneeze on that hamburger, what are you going to do? Oh, I don't want to fry another one up, I'll just pass it out. You know? The guy's like, hey, I didn't ask for relish on my hamburger. You know? <laughs> and he's like, oh, just, just scrape it off. <laughs> you know. And you're like, I want to be a nuclear physicist. And God's up in heaven saying, I'll never let you be a nuclear physicist. You blow up the world. You didn't take care of hamburgers. How am I going to let you take be a nuclear physicist? And you're like, well, how come I never get anywhere in life? And because you never learn to do what's right in God's eyes when you're alone. I'll tell you what, God tests us when we're alone to see what we are. And God can see, this is a man after my own heart. If he'll take care of lambs when no one's watching, he'll take care of my people when nobody's watching. And so that was his first qualification. The first way to be a witness for Jesus Christ, how God prepares us, is to do what's right when you're alone. Secondly, after he tells him he killed the lion and, and struck him and killed him and, and delivered that lamb, then he says something in verse 36, very interesting. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Number two, here's the second way God can prepare you to be a great witness for Jesus Christ. You ready? Number two, face extreme difficulties over and over. You got that? Number two, face extreme difficulties over and over. All right? 
Saul says, why should I let you go out and face this giant? You're just a teenager. David says, well, I kept my father's sheep. And there came a rabbit out of the woods. And he tried to eat the grass that was meant for my father's sheep. And I said, oh, no, you don't. And I took my staff and that, that rabbit, he wiggled his nose at me. But I said, I'm not afraid of you. And I smote him and slew him. And I wear that rabbit's ears on my belt. And then another day, a mouse came out from under a rock when I was eating my lunch, and he tried to take my pickle. But I didn't let him scare me. I took my sandal and I squished him. Your servant has killed both the rabbit and the mouse, and this giant shall be like one of them. See, and he has defied the armies of the living God. And what was Saul? Ooh, rabbit slayer. Uh, okay, wow. You have really killed some some dangerous animals in your lifetime. Yep, rabbit and mouse. No, that's not what he says. He says, I, I kept my father's sheep and a lion came. And I killed them. I killed both the lion and the bear. I'll tell you what. There was big difficulties in his life. I don't know about you, I don't like big difficulties. God, make my life easy. Amen? <laughs> you know, God, I, I don't want any more trials. I don't want another test. But God's like, I think I found, I think I found a guy who could be the next king. Let's see. I'm going to send a line into this kid's life. Is he going to just, here, take a layout, you know, leave me alone. I could be killed. Or is he going to be like, that's my father's land. Come back here, lion. And, you know, he kills him. Lion delivers the lion. Goes, that's pretty cool. I wonder if he'll do it again. Did you ever get through a big trial and you're like, God, I passed the test. And I was like, will you do it again? You know, the Bible calls that perseverance. Will you persevere to character? Suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope, it says in Romans chapter 5. Will you persevere through those difficult things? And like I said, number two, you need to face extreme difficulties over and over again. Which difficulty will it be in your life that will stop you from continuing on serving the Lord? God will test you with lions and bears, not rabbits and mice. Okay? And so he says, can you just, I can just hear what David's really saying. He says, I killed a lion and a bear. In other words, why should I let you go kill this giant? He goes, well, I kill big things for a living. It's just my, that's my everyday job. Lions and bears, giants, oh my. I can do it. I've been tested and I do not run away. And God, how he prepares you is he will ask you to face extreme difficulties over and over again. Not just once, but he will test you until you're ready. And so he says, I kill lions, plural, I kill bears, plural. And this giant will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. I'm not afraid of giants because I have faced bigger things in my life. Maybe even more dangerous than this giant. But there's one more thing I think God uses to prepare us. The first one is, He always tests us to make sure that we do what's right in God's eyes when we're alone. Will you pass that test? Secondly, will you face extreme difficulties over and over again? David did. But I think this is the most important, verse 37. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Number three, I think the third way God prepares us is as we learn to ask God for help. Number three, ask God for help. I'm so amazed at it. When I talk to teenagers sometimes, they're like, man, I got this problem. And I, I said, well, have you prayed about it? Well, not really. Uh, have you asked God to help you? Well, I, I don't know God that well. And I'm not, I'm not really good at prayer. And, 
And what, I'll tell you what, if I have a lion bearing down on me, a lion that re rears up on its back legs and comes after me and you're grabbing it by the mane and fighting, what are you going to say? I'll tell you what, I'm going to say, God help me! Help me! I might even start it when he, when he grabbed the, the lamb in the first place. Oh dear Lord, make him drop it. I need it, Lord. He didn't drop it. God, should I go after it? Yes. Oh Lord, help me. Maybe it was started when he first began. Oh, I don't want to be a shepherd. Oh Lord, help me to have a good attitude about being a shepherd. Lord, help my attitude. Boy, don't we need to start there. Amen. Lord, help my attitude. I want to be your servant. I want to be a witness for you. God, I want to, there was something in the heart of David that made him seek the Lord and ask him for help. And then he gets through that and then, Woo, thank you, Lord, I killed the lion. Oh, thank you, Lord, so much. Oh, I'm going to, uh, all the Psalms of David, I'm sure he wrote some of them when he was a shepherd, you know. And he writes a song. God, help me kill the lion. la di da di da and feed the sheep that are so sweet. La -di -da -da -da. And what? A bear? What are you doing, God? Testing you. Right? You know, I saw you kill the lion. Are you going to kill the bear, too? I hit my chest, but it hurts. <laughs> I will. Kill the Come here, bear. You know. And so he's been killing lions and bears and... And he comes, and he's been walking with this God. He loves this God. He sings songs to him. And this God who delivered him from the Paul the Lion and Paul the Bear. I'll tell you what. It's Jesus Christ who delivered me from my sin and my shame and my pain. And I'll tell you what. I want to live for him. And when I, when I first got saved, I remember going home and starting to read my Bible and pray. I'll tell you, God was how I was going to help me. Back then, all we had was the King James Version. Did you ever try to understand that? Then, you know, it's thou and thee and cometh and goeth and watch out for concupiscence. I'm like, concupiscence? What's that? I still don't even know what it is. But I pray, God, help me to understand my Bible and read, and read it and pray. And God, help me. God, help me. God, help me. I remember going to school and telling my friends, I was like, you know what? Uh, you don't have to work your way to heaven. Only Jesus. And they're like, where's that in the Bible? I'm like, uh, it's in there somewhere. I didn't even know where it was. I had to study. And then people were like, well, who says the Bible's God's word? I'm like, oh, no. And I, and I had to go through that trial and face that and, until God convinced me that the Bible's God's word. Amen? I'll tell you, you've got to face giants over and over again. But I love God enough. And David loved God enough. He's like, Lord, help me. Help me to be a warrior. Help me to be a good shepherd. And I, I'm sure that continued when one day he became a king. But he said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and paw of the bear, he would deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul, who was the king, was willing to give it up to David. Yeah, go and the Lord be with you. Should have been Saul that went out to fight the giant. But he didn't have the faith that David did. And David had the courage and he, he's like, He's like, I want to stand up for the living God. And that's what he said to his brothers and all the soldiers. He said, who is this Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Can't somebody go out there and stop him? He had a heart for God's name. And I hope you have a heart for the name of Jesus Christ. And you're like, I want to make you famous, God, in the world. And then God will give you these three ways to prepare for that. So you're going to find yourself in... Places of loneliness. I'll tell you what, this this COVID-19 uh, shutdown that we've had. I know a lot of you have been in lonely places. That's a great place for God to, to meet you and say, I want, I want to see if you'll be faithful when you're alone. Or you're just going to give up. He will send great things into your life. He will, great difficulties in your life to prepare you. And I just want to encourage you that David did what uh, that you would do what David did, and that is number three, ask God for help. You know, some of you aren't walking with God very well right now. And so I want to challenge you right now as you're listening. And you're like, you know what, God, I, I, I'm not a warrior like that. I don't have a witness for you. I don't feel like witnessing. 
Maybe you can start right where David did perhaps with his attitude and realize that the only thing that's going to deliver you is from the hand, from the paw of the lion and Paul the bear is the salvation and deliverance from the hand of God. Well, David goes out and he meets the Philistine. You know the rest of the story. Saul tries to put his armor on him, on David, and the next few verses is David says, I, I can't wear these. I haven't tested them. I haven't tried them. I haven't put them to the test. Like he says, when I killed the lion and the bear, I used my slingshot and, and, and I used my staff, you know. And so he says, that's what he, that's what he went out with, the staff. And he went out with a slingshot. He picked up five smooth stones because he learned that the smooth stones, they fly more true. And, and so that was his weapon. And he went out there and it says that, that the giant says, who are you to come uh, with me with, with a staff or like a stick? He says, you, you come to me like I'm a dog. And he goes, and David says, you're worse than a dog because you defy the armies of the living God. And, uh, and uh, Goliath says, well, I'm going to give you your carcass to the beasts of the field. You know what David said? He said, I'm going to give you and the whole host of the Philistines. I'm giving the whole army of the Philistines to the beasts of the field. I'm taking you down, and, and Israel's going to be saved. I'll tell you, he had courage to stand up for his God. And he put that rock and that slingshot. Now, it wasn't the type of slingshot we think of sometimes, with, you know, a wide, a little stone. You know, that would have just kind of nicked him, you know. But back then, the stones they used were about as big as my fist. And they put them in a leather pouch that had two strings on it, of leather strings, and you hold it like this, and you get this going, swinging it over your head. And it said he ran towards the giant, and he was sure he'd been tested. And he ran towards him, like, oh, come on. He was like, oh, you're so big. No, he was like, I've been fighting big things. God's prepared me. And he ran towards him, and he let that string go, and that rock come flying out. And then giant's like, why you little brat, you little genius? Boom! Hit him in the head. He fell down. David went over, took out the giant sword, and chopped the guy's head off. And I can't see, just as he lifted it up and said, Hey, Philistine army, here's your champion. In the name of the Lord. And said the whole army ran away. And he did give the carcasses of the army of the Philistines to the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air. I'll tell you what, God can do great things through the heart of one courageous teenager. Do you love Jesus as much as David loved his God? Because his God is our God. They call Jesus the son of David. Because he is the king of kings. He's not just the king of Israel. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. And he's worthy to be stood up for. Amen? I pray that God will use these things in your life to say, I want to stand up for Jesus Christ. God, be with me when I'm alone. Do what's right in your eyes. Secondly, help me to face extreme difficulties. What are your extreme difficulties right now? And number three, ask God for help. Light it all bow your heads and close your eyes right now as we close. And I just want you to pick one of those things maybe that's missing in your life. Maybe it's all three. Maybe some of you have never asked God for help. Would you do that right now? Say, Lord Jesus, come into my life and Save me. Deliver me like you delivered David from the paw of the lion, from the paw of the bear. Deliver me from my sin. Deliver me that I might love you like David loved you. And that I might be a witness for you. That I might stand up in the crowd and make a stand for the Lord Jesus. That I might be able to bring down giants. Bring down that in the reasoning of the great truth of the word of God. Father, we are we're so needy. And Father, sometimes we're so we're so scared. So prepare us to be like David. We want to be a witness for Jesus Christ. Father, in this day and age, we need you. And this world needs Jesus. They don't think they do, but they do need him. May we be a shining light and a witness to who he is and of his great salvation. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for listening.
We'll see you at camp in 2021, or maybe sooner than you think. You are dismissed.